Welcome to Restaurant Food Fast with your host, Chuck Brooks. Hey everybody, welcome back to Restaurant Food Fast. Um, today we're going to do the mac and cheese recipe that I've been saying I'm going to do because I got my lazy butt out to the store and got the stuff I needed. Uh, which isn't a lot, I just didn't have any uh, cheddar cheese on hand. Um, so, we're going to do, um, we're going to do a mac and cheese, easy stove top, um, can be baked in addition to, but this, like I said, this show's about quick and fast, and I'm going to show you how you can do it right on the stove top and be ready to go. Um, and I'm also going to show you how to do, uh, scalloped potatoes, um, because the basis for the sauce is pretty much the same. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do those real fast too. And again, both things can be baked. They're normally casseroles, but I'm going to show you how to do them right from the stove top so they'll be done between the stove top and the microwave. Um, it'll be all done. Both dishes will be done within the, you know, 20 minutes or so that we usually take. So come on back. I'll show you the ingredients list and, uh, all right, ready to go. I'm going to show you the stuff we need to do the mac and cheese and the, uh, potatoes. Uh, it's just like I say, real simple, same sauce for both things. Um, I'm going to show you the mac and cheese first, it's real easy. I'm going to make a root, flour, butter, some milk, um, cream if you want it, it just depends on how much fat content you want. I'm using like whole milk for this one just because it seems to cook better. Um, elbow macaroni. And I'm going to shoot this up a bit, and I'm going to make it a jalapeno cheddar. So it'll be uh, a little different than what you're used to, but it's jalapeno cheddar go real well together. So I'm just going to use some jalapenos in this recipe. Um, you can use it or not if you like. I also put in hot sauce and a little bit of um, Dijon mustard when I cook it. Um, just kind of adds a little zip to it. You really don't taste it that much. It doesn't flavor it a whole lot. It's still going to be a basic cheese sauce, um, but those ingredients tend to add a little more life to it. it gives it a little deeper dimension. Um, so that's pretty much it. It's real easy. Um, I've got water boiling. I'm going to dump in the mac. should be enough. This is what, oh geez, three pound box, so that's probably about a pound of pasta I put in there. Get this out of my way. Start this front one. That's what I'm going to make my roux in to start my sauce. This is basic bechamel sauce. Um, same way we did the Alfredo. Any of the cream sauces, any of the cream sauces pretty much start the same way. Well, I don't want to say that. Not cream sauces. Um, because you can make a sauce by just adding cream to some sort of pan liquor or, um, you know, juice. So this is a basic bechamel. It's real easy. Get that cranked up and melt and stir this around. Elbow macaroni, for some reason, elbow macaroni sticks more than any other pasta you ever cook. I don't know why. Maybe just because there's so much square area on it, but uh, it's just a pain in my butt. You have to stir it constantly. That was one of my chefs would scream through the kitchen all the time because it was an Italian restaurant. And uh, steer it, steer it, steer the pasta. That's all you heard all day. Because if you forgot, you got this big lump of pasta. And old school chef, you get really jacked. Um, so while that's heating up, I'm going to introduce you guys to one of my kitchen things that I use constantly. Um, this is a mandolin. Basically this is a cheaper version. The real ones are all stainless steel and they are about I don't know, 200 to 300 dollars depending. This one is from OXO and it does pretty much the same thing. It has all the features that you need. Um, it's about 40 dollars. All those Roncomatic gerbil roasters that you know used to see the things that you know slice and dice a pickle and a knife and a beer can. Well, they're built off of the premise of this. 
Um, and what it does is on, on the side there's a, a knob, a rotary knob, and this is a blade. So you basically adjust this deck to how thick or thin you want your product cut. Also when you do that, if you look on the back, there's a roller in here. And inside that roller there are different blades that can come up. So you can make shoestring potatoes, thick cut potatoes, french fries. Um, and you can also tug the blades out and you have a waffle blade on one side and a regular straight blade on the other. Um, if you're looking for a gadget that you're going to use a lot, this will be it. I'm going to use it as potatoes. I'll show you in a minute. Because I hear my butter going ballistic over here. So I'm making quite a bit of sauce because I'm using two different recipes. Um, so I put in a whole stick of butter. Actually, it's not butter. It's margarine. Um, any, any oil product will work. You can make a roux out of olive oil if you like. You can make it out of peanut oil, you can make it out of anything. It's just basically a combination of flour and fat. And it makes that thickening agent. So I'm going to get this all melted down, add the flour to it, cook it a little bit, and then I'll put the milk in and show you how the, the basic goes. Stir this stuff again because I don't want a big clump of it. That's good, it's all broke down. Flour, now I, I mean, some people ask me, comment about the show and wonder how much flour I'm using and I don't, I don't actually measure it. I put it in so it gets the thickness I want for the roux and for the amount of product I'm making. And that's how I judge. I really don't know how much I'm, I'm using. Um, I guess that's a difference between working in the kitchen as a pro and just learning and trying to do it from home. It's experience. It's just like anything else. If you've done it enough times, you know, pretty much this is what I'm looking for. Um, I've got a paste. Now you can make that thinner or thicker as you like it. Um, you make a paste and you cook it a little bit. It's going to turn from a, a how to describe it, a raw smell, the raw flour. When it starts cooking, it starts getting this nutty, nutty aroma. The darker you cook it, um, the more pronounced that aroma is. And I, I know I discussed it before, the darker your roux is, the less liquid it can absorb. So lighter roux, called blonde roux, will absorb much more liquid than, uh, say, a, a dark roux, a dark brown roux. Um, and I'll, all I'm doing is basically cooking this to get the flour, have the flour absorb all the uh, fat. And that's what causes it to not have lump. I mean, the base is, this is to me the hardest part of it, is getting, getting your roux done. Because once the roux is cooked, all you do is add your liquid, um, add your cheese, mix it in. That's it. That's all you do. So as I said, you can, this can be a casserole, a baked dish, um, where you would take your product after you put it all together, and you'll see at the end where I'm ready to serve it. Um, you can take this, put this in a casserole dish, top it with whatever you like, um, Parmesan cheese, breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs and butter, you know, that whole nine yards to make the uh, gratin for it, throw it in the broiler, or in the, just in the oven, and let it bake until it browns off, and it's, you know, gets that traditional homemade uh, texture. It doesn't really change the flavor a whole lot, it does change a little bit, not a whole lot. So that's it, that roux is pretty much done. Uh, starting to get brown bits on the bottom of it. Um, the smell has gone from raw to more of a nutty smell. And I'm going to start adding milk. Little bits at a time. 
and whisk it in to get rid of the lumps. Overheat. Now your thickening agents. Okay, when you put this first thing of milk in, it is going to be lumpy. Don't worry about it. Keep mixing it. As the milk heats up, it's going to start soaking up. Actually, the flour is going to start soaking up the milk. It's going to get thicker and thicker. So, as you can see here, it's getting thick. There's still lumps in it. Don't worry about it. The more, as you add more and more milk to it, it's going to smooth out. And there you go. Let it heat again. That's the other thing when you're using thickening agents. Um, Got to bring them up to temperature. Got to bring them up to slightly before a boil, roughly. Um, so that's like 210. So once you see, you see your first couple bubbles coming up, or right before the first couple bubbles will come up, then you know your product is it's it's maximum capacity um, for thickening. That's as thick as it's ever going to get, unless you sit and simmer it and reduce it back down again, um, which is a pain, but kind of defeats the purpose of making it with a root. But that's it. You just keep stirring it. Uh, beat all the little lumps out. As they break down, they're just going to start absorbing the milk. And you have your basic bechamel. At this point, you can start seasoning because you have a few minutes. When you do this at the beginning, as you put that milk in, it sucks it up right now. Because there's not enough cold liquid in there to, uh, to slow it down. It just it immediately starts reacting. So once you get a, a second or so, while this is coming up to temperature, you can start seasoning it. Um, I'm just going to hit it with some pepper, some salt, I'm not going to use a whole lot of salt because the cheese has a sodium content also, so I don't want to over salt this at the beginning because um, you can't get it back out. I know I tell you don't worry, you know, make sure you season all your food, that's true. But you have you got to think of when you're going to do it and what you're adding because if you add too much in at the beginning um, and you add other ingredients that have sodium content, you're never going to get it back out. This is uh, habanero. I like the flavor of, the, of Frank's. I just I tend to like the habanero a little bit better. I'm just going to add a couple couple shots of that, maybe a quarter teaspoon, not a, not not much. Um, okay, as you can see, this thickened up again. Right, from what it was, now it's now it's more of a, a traditional sauce depth. But because we're going to be adding cheese to it, it's going to thicken up again. So what I'm going to do is add a little more milk to it. Well, actually, not a little more, quite a bit more milk to it. Now I'm going to add a. shot or two of Dijon mustard to it. That's pretty much it. Stir this up some more. Check on the noodles, make sure they haven't formed a big ball at the bottom of my pot like they want to do. It's a nice smooth, real smooth consistency. That's a nice thing about working with brews is they, they it gets a really good smooth sauce. Um, they're real easy to do, and they they like I say, you can't go wrong making a gravy. So let's taste this before I hit the cheese just to see where it's setting. Pretty mild. Pretty mild. I think I'm gonna add a little more salt. Now, a typical bechamel would have a onion PK, they call it, where you just you take an onion and you stud it with cloves and spices, and ah, it's it's basically a white gravy. Um, and like I said before, if you add anything to this, you should change your sauces. You change it into velouté's. You you can. Now this is one of your basic sauces. You can make a ton of stuff with it. Um, this is the basis for all 
all of your cream soups. Um, cream of broccoli, cream of potato, clam chowder, um, all those things. When you, you know, there's, there's names. The reason these things are called what they are, it, it designates what's in it. Like chowders have potatoes. Um, so you know if it's a chowder, it's going to have potatoes no matter what kind. Corn chowder has potatoes. If something's Florentine, it has spinach. It's just just the nomenclature. So you see all these different recipes, it's just telling you what's in it. So that's pretty good. I think, I think the consistency's right. It's going to thicken up a little bit more. Um, I've just got some shredded cheddar. You can buy it in a bag. Um, I just happened to shred some out of a block that I had because I was good enough to go and uh, get the cheddar. But I'm just going to put a bunch of this in because I like a very cheesy taste to it. Try and get it in the pot. I'm going to stir that off real slow. Um, at this point, turn your heat down as I can feel it starting to, the sauce wanting to stick to the bottom. And you basically have a cheddar cheese soup at this point. So there you go. Another recipe you can get out of the same one we're doing today for mac and cheese for um, scalloped potatoes. And now it's hot enough that it's melted all that cheese in there. And that's it. Basically you've got a cheese sauce. A lot of it. I've got about half a pot of cheese sauce here. So you figure I put in what a good half gallon of milk. Um, And the other thing, you may be looking at this going, you know what, this isn't really that thick. Pasta always absorbs. So when you're making sauces that you're going to immerse pasta in, that pasta is not going to stop sucking up that moisture. never does. If you put pasta in soup and you leave it in the fridge, when you come back the next day, all you're going to have is pasta. You're not going to have the soup left. The pasta is going to take it all. Um, so let me taste this again and see if there's anything else I need to it. Nope. Just fine right the way it is. Check these noodles. I'm going to let them cook a little longer. They're still a little hard. Um, while I'm doing that, I'm getting rid of my spatula again, which is going to kill me. I know it. These things are all done. Don't need this anymore. I'm going to show you the mandolin. Slice up some potatoes and show you how to do the um, Basically, I'm just going to start with a couple of potatoes, say, oh, I don't know, four, five. These are smaller ones. I'm going to wash them off. I'm not even, I'm not peeling these. They're, I'm just going to throw them through the mandolin and that'll be it. Um, I got this set at about, I don't know, I guess it's an eighth or a quarter. Probably more like an eighth. Yeah, that's about an eighth. Yeah. Um, I got this set at about, I don't know, I guess it's an eighth or a quarter. Probably more like an eighth. Yeah, that's about an eighth. This is the nice thing about a mandolin. Watch your fingers. They all come with guards. Um, use the guards. They, that's what they're there for. As I don't use the guard. Yes, I know. That's pretty much it. And this is the beauty of having a mandolin. Um, it's so fast 
at doing repetitive work. It just takes all the time away from you. And I don't care if you buy one of those Roncomatic gerbil roaster ones that you see on TV. Um, anything that's going to save you time in the kitchen, I don't care who makes it, it's worth it. Um, Alton Brown, one of my favorite shows, it hit multitaskers. He's, everything in his kitchen has got to have more than one purpose. Um, and that's a really good rule of thumb because you can get so many gadgets out there today to do you know, one specific thing real well. If you get something like this that can do just a ton of different things, it saves you so much space. So the basic difference, if you're wondering why you would spend the money on a more expensive mandolin, um, just basic, basic feature set. You'll have more adjustments. The more money you spend on one, the more adjustments you get. Uh, the better the quality of the blade is. Uh, this one works fine for me because I don't do a whole lot of different uh, things for it. I usually just use it like this as production. Um, so when you go to look, if you have the money to buy a $200 one, and you can go to one of these uh, upper upper echelon cooking stores and buy one, go for it. Little plastic ones for, you know, 10 bucks at, at corner stores all over the place. Um, now, the trick with doing these, so it doesn't take a ton of time, if you want to do these to eat them now, nuke them. It's not protein. Throw the potatoes in the microwave, it cuts the time on them just like that. Sounds off. Um, give me a sec. My uh, producer slash edit man tells me, try not to be talking when the microwave goes on. Because he doesn't want to have to try and edit that beep in between my work. Which I think is terribly funny. Does it look like we're scripted? <laughs> the object of the show is to show you that anybody can do this. Um, all right, I think these are done. Ow! Well, we know they're hot, about 200 degrees. Yeah, they're done. So I'm going to take these and dump them in a colander. Now, another trick I learned uh, from one of my first chefs, and that's another thing. Don't, don't think that you're going to start off doing this and be fantastic, be wonderful and be able to cook. That's why you're watching these shows, so you can learn how. I don't know anybody in the world who started off being good. Um, I'm not good at this point, but I was 10 times worse when I first started. I was, oh my God, I used to drive my chefs crazy. That was, was horrible, horrible. Um, but everybody starts that way. Read Bourdain's books, Anthony Bourdain. If you want to get a good picture of old school cooking, he, he gives you, he gives you an insight as to what the kitchens used to be like. Um, and I'm sure they're still out there just like they are now. Uh, but, or just like that now. I think they've gotten a little more laid back. So I don't think they're quite as, as uh, cutthroat. But then again, I've never worked a New York City restaurant before. So I can't tell you. He may be dead on. And it's still that way everywhere. Uh, as for the mac and cheese, it's done. That's it. Now I'm going to take some of these. All right, I'm just going to take some of the jalapenos and some of the sauce or the liquid and put it in with the mac and cheese. As I dump it all over my counter. That's it. It's done. If you take a look, that's all there is to it. As you uh, let this sit, it's going to suck up everything that you put in it. So eat it hot. When you go to reheat it, mix some milk with it. Um, you can put milk, a little more cheese in it, and it'll it'll loosen it up again. Unless you want to do a couple of the other recipes where you take the big congealed mass and drop it in a deep fryer and you have deep fried mac and cheese. 
a real southern favorite. It tastes good, it's just way too much effort for me. Um, but that's it, mac and cheese is done. Same thing goes for the potatoes. Um, they're going to take a little longer because of the nuke time. So uh, I'm going to dish this up and I'll be right back and I'll show you how to do the potatoes. All right, um, mac and cheese is done. The exact same sauce. I saved about half of it, a little under half of it. I took those potatoes, threw them in a the mic. Um, now, th there is a difference between these recipes. When you bake these till done, they're going to soak up the cream and milk and cheese. It's going to give a little deeper flavor. If this is something you just, you're just you in the mood for and you want to do now, um, it's really easy to do because all, you, all I did was slice them up, put them in the microwave until they were cooked. Um, the same sauce I have and I've got cut up hunks of ham. So if I can get this package open. Culinary is finest. Mix those around. Throw in your potatoes, mix those around. The only issue I have with doing potatoes in the microwave is when you slice them thin and they start cooking, they want to clump together. Um, and I kind of want them to separate so they can all be covered with the cheese sauce. It's not a big deal. It'll, uh, it'll work itself out as you stir them. But uh, super quick and easy way for scalloped scallop potatoes with ham. Um, you can also take this, again, put it in a casserole dish, throw it in the oven, and bake it off. You know, you're going to cook the potatoes again. Who cares? They're not, it's not going to worry it at all. Um, but this takes a lot of time off of the, the traditional method of cooking this. Um, if you have the time, then just don't cook your potatoes. Make the same base, same thing, put the potatoes in raw, throw it in the oven, cook it till it's done. There you go. <clears throat> same way with the, the mac and cheese. Um, instead of just serving it straight out, you just throw it in the, in the oven for an hour and it's finished. Now, I was telling you about the mac and cheese. As you let it sit, look what happens to it. Now you've got that big clump um, that is usually associated with having homemade mac and cheese. That's why when you start, make it thinner. Make the sauce much thinner than you think. Add more sauce than you think because those noodles are going to suck up everything you put into it. So, um, there you go. This is the the uh, scalloped potatoes. I'm going to plate those up real quick. The mac and cheese is gone already. The first bowl I plated. My son, the human garbage disposal, ate that. It took about, I think, eight minutes for these potatoes to cook. So I didn't want to sit there and bore you to death by talking nonstop. Um, but I got a little sidetracked when I was talking about one of my chefs. If you make a cheese sauce and you don't like the way it turns, it, it's missing something, add just a little bit of chicken stock to it. For some reason, chicken stock brings out the taste of the cheese. Um, it's basically the dry mustard ingredient does the same thing. It adds just a little bit of something to it that brings out that flavor. Um, chicken stock will do it too. It's, it's really easy. And that's it. These are the, the scalloped potatoes. Um, same sauce, same thing. Now you can take that same exact sauce, put it in a bowl. There you go. Cheddar soup. Um, don't put the cheese in, put the potatoes in. Cream potato soup. It, it just, it, the, it's endless what you can do with this. Any single cream soup sauce that you've ever had starts here. Um, anything in the soup base, anything in the chowders, anything that is a, a white cream sauce starts there. So you learn how to make it. Now you can make any of those things that you've tried at a restaurant. And the only thing that you, you're going to learn is what makes it taste the way it does. What spices are they using to give it that particular flavor? 
Um, and as you go through and start using the sauces, in the, not the sauces, but the spices that we use, um, you'll figure it out. You'll, you'll know it makes it taste the way it does. So that's it. You got two recipes for the price of one today. Um, real simple. You know, you actually got about, I don't know, 4,000. But uh, that's it. Um, I'm going to take the photos of this and give it to the garbage can. And I'll be All right. Well, there you have it. Um, mac and cheese. And what's the name of those potatoes again? Go. Scalloped potatoes. Um, same sauce. Two different recipes. Real easy. Next week, we're going to follow on that same line of thinking um, and I'm going to show you how to turn that same basic sauce into cream soups. Um, we'll do maybe a potato, we'll do a clam chowder um, and a cheese and broccoli and I'll show you how fast and easy it is to do all those three from that same thing and I'll also show you how to do some real fast chicken soups. Um, and If I can find the right product, I don't know if they still have it, um, I'll even do the, um, the wedding soup uh, which is it's Real easy. It's basically chicken soup. Um, it's just the product you put into it. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. That's what we'll do next week. Um, again, we appreciate all the the comments and the feedback and uh, everybody coming over and taking a look at this stuff. Uh, we're just goofing around. We're we're having a good time doing it. Um, trying to bridge that gap between everybody looking at these chefs going, well, yeah, of course he can do that. He knows what he's doing. He's but anybody can do this. It's really really easy. Um, and that's what we're here for. We're here to show you that in an average kitchen with just normal stuff around, you can make good food really quickly. So keep the comments coming. Um, restaurantfoodfast at gmail.com. And like I say, anything that you get, throw it my way and we'll see what we can do. We'll try and put it up as a recipe or I'll get you an answer. So until next week, have a good one. Take care.